The text of the, the message this morning is from uh, the Old Testament reading in Isaiah 40, uh, going back to verse 3. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is our text. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> God's word here is pretty tough on us. Uh, I, I was thinking that uh, there are some life circumstances, like so much of what God does, it is uh, impossible to undo, to uh, rescue yourself out of it. Uh, it. There are accidents, and there's sickness, and there's tragedy, and those things that happen to us, and there's very little we can stop about it, whether... Uh, sometimes it's slow and sometimes it's quick, but uh, there, there isn't any hand to fix some of these things. I guess you talk about the, to some extent, at least the horrors of life and death. I, I'm, I'm bringing that to you because apparently God sees us that way sometimes. Uh, Isaiah uh, is sent out by God here. Uh, to call out people as like grass or, or like flowers. Uh, here today, gone tomorrow is kind of the, the image that they throw at you. Um, and it seems to be at God's own hand. Uh, it, well, I mean, even if it didn't say something like that, it'd be sort of obvious because uh, God can stop anything if it seems good to him. And sometimes it seems that it's good to him to, to, to let things go, and it's really hard for us to tell the difference. Uh, at the same time, for whatever reason, as, as hard as that part is, uh, he tells Isaiah to call out for comfort to his people. Comfort, comfort even, twice. And, and there's a, a, a double uh, change, a, a, a gift or comfort back for all of Israel's sins, but you understand that they are in exile when these things are said to them. Uh, the, the whole thing has been brought about by God. Uh, they're there because they're human beings, because they're sinners, because they do so many things wrong, and God is the one who put them in exile in the first place, and now he comes to say, comfort, comfort my people. And on the other hand, he says they're like grass and flowers. Is very confusing. Uh, and I guess to just make it more confusing, he calls for uh, people to prepare paths for the Lord, uh, which is rather strange because, uh, well, if you're in exile in Babylon, between you and home, uh, where God had said that he dwells in his temple there in Jerusalem, there's a whole bunch of really nasty desert, probably the worst, nasty, hottest, driest, deathly desert on the planet, uh, the Saudi desert. Uh, how are you supposed to build a highway if you're in exile and you're oppressed and, and God put you there in the first place? How are you supposed to build a, uh, a highway from there to there uh, in the wilderness? How can anyone make a road like that? It's an impassable desert, essentially. And, uh, well, it's, it's a kind of a mixed message. You've got hope and you've got hopelessness at the same time coming from God, and it's very hard. Now, it, it seems like, I, you know, stop me if I'm wrong about this, it seems like we should have more value to God than grass or flowers, uh, no matter what, though, however it seems to us, God can see your sinfulness. It's not like it stops. He knows exactly even what the future holds, and you haven't even thought of how much trouble you can get in yet, and he knows already. He can see that you sin. He can see that it offends him. He can see that it's going to continue. Uh, death kind of portrayed here like the breath of God that, that destroys 
is the rightful outcome for sinners. It's, that's what we should get. Now, how even can anyone escape the open and direct demand and declaration of God? So, you know, we, we have the same difficult message of where is the hope, where is the rescue? And here we sit in the, uh, the impossible wilderness of our sin and leading to death and condemnation. Here we sit. Now, as Israel, as it turns out, was in fact restored without any effort on their own because they couldn't make any. Uh, they didn't get themselves home to Israel. God did that. He inspired people to provide them a way, not uh, a highway exactly, but uh, the means and the ability to get to where they needed to go, to put their city back, to put their temple back, <coughs> to put, if you will, the Old Testament residents of God back together. And they were brought home across the wilderness expanse from Babylon to Jerusalem, somehow rather miraculously, but also uh, from the greater expanse of their sin because they deserved to be in Babylon. Uh, they instigated that and God made it happen, but th their sin is what got them there and they have overcome that, not by their own efforts, but again, they have a place with their loving and merciful God because he made it so. Now, it's true, kind of unavoidably, uh, that we should be destroyed utterly because of sin and, and uh, lead ourselves to death and condemnation. But the way of the Lord, as it turns out, in the same way that it was prepared for the people of Israel, has also been prepared for you. You heard some of that in the gospel message that John the Baptist was uh, the way that God has sent to prepare the way for Jesus to come. But that's only part of the story because, you see, you understand that uh, we need a way to God. You can't go to God because you don't know where he is. How could he be, he be found? But it's, it's not like God is unaware of this. So he came to you. The, we're in this Advent season. Christ's first advent is about to be celebrated in this Christmas season where the Son of God is born into the world, just like he's promised here in Isaiah in this very passage, as cryptic as it might well seem. And, and he himself sent messengers to announce his presence in the world. There were the angels that came to the shepherds, and there were the wise men that came to the king, and there were... Uh, uh, disciples that were sent ahead of him to walk and there was John the Baptist preparing the people for them all that was done by God set up by God for the coming of the Savior to rescue you completely by his coming that's why he came by his own precious blood by his death by his rising from death uh, destroying death for you and by the Holy Spirit that he sent to you that lives in you even now God announced here that all flesh shall see him together. Well, you, you, you could say that uh, everybody that was walking around in Jesus' time, there were an awful lot of them, and saw God in the flesh. Because there was Jesus standing there. His face was there. That was the face of God. And they all saw him. Uh, but that was only part of the world. It was certainly not all flesh. Because there's been a lot of people that have come before you and there'll be more after you. And there's a fair chance that somewhere along the line that you'll find yourself facing your own mortality. But even though many saw him in his first coming, uh, there is this great promise that Isaiah throws out on the table that he'll come again to make all things new, to perfect everything, even you. And all of that will be for your good, for your eternity, for your welcome place with him. He's waiting to come for that, for your eternal perfection, for your holiness, for the life that has been promised and waits in perfection by his side. All of this waits for the second advent. 
whether you are living or dead, the promise will stand. Uh, Isaiah says the word of the Lord will stand forever and he's promised this to you, his own children, his bride, his own body, his personal people. And so when he comes, when he rises, he will raise you. You will be incorruptible, you will be immortal, and you will be eternal with him. Uh, there's this the other thing here that uh, may be not obvious to you. Uh, Isaiah calls you God's people. Uh, he, he calls you heralds. And I'm, you know, we're not talking about your name because you're obviously not all herald. But he's talking about a herald that goes out in front of a king and announces his coming. Or his presence even. Uh, that's what they did when kings showed up at the castle door. The herald comes forth and says, hey, by the way, the king's out here. I, but they were probably more formal than that. But it turns out that, that this is part of your enduring purpose as you walk around in this world. Uh, you are the ones that know that Jesus has been here. You are the ones that know, according to the promise, that he will come again. And your job as you walk around in this world, although it may not go just exactly like this, is to say, to call out, behold your God. Because that's what he is to you. And he's been here. And he'll come again. And he is salvation. And he is your promised glory. He is the perfection of your eternity. Uh, see, and by these things you can have joy in Christ. By the Holy Spirit that lives in you. That brings these things about to encourage you to live in a godly fashion with his word in your mouth and in your hands. And that is what will happen until he comes for you to bring you to his house in perfection and in paradise. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.